we want to spend a little time here talking about the differences between C++ and Java in terms of how we go from source code to creation of an executable and running. Um, we want to talk a little bit about the portability as Java is um, defined to be or uh, described to be very portable. We want to you know, kind of get an understanding of what that is. So let's move on to, let's get started here. <clears throat> So let's start with C++, because uh, probably the language you did in an intro to programming course. Uh, suppose we want to take an application and we want to be able to run that application on a Windows machine or a Mac machine. Um, so we start with the source code. And the basic flow is to uh, do a first step of compile. And from the Windows side, we, would, uh, we need a Windows compiler, something that runs on a Windows machine. And it's going to compile into object code. And that object code is going to be Windows specific. On the Mac side, we need something, a compiler that runs in the OS X environment and knows how to generate object code for an OS X environment. Um, after the compilation stage is done, we go through a linking phase uh, to bring the executables together. And similar to, with con uh, similar to compilation, <coughs> we have the Windows uh, linker has to be something that can run on a Windows machine and know how to link Windows object code into an executable that can run on a Windows machine. And on the other side, we need, in order to get an executable for the OS X environment, we need a linker that can run in OS X, and it has to know how to pull together those object code files into something that can execute. In terms of sharing, the best we have is uh, being able to share all our source code so we can maintain a single uh, repository of code and when time comes, we could just compile it into and link it into an executable that can run on our target platform. Uh, but this is about the best we can do. So let's switch our attention to uh, two Windows machines. Uh, so given a set of source code, how can we get an application that can run on both? Well, if we go one towards one machine, let's assume we have a compiler. We can compile the source code into a collection of object files. Um, we can take those object files and link them together in executable. Now, assuming that our application has only used uh, C++ core li libraries, and let's assume we're running on similar operating systems here, we can just take that executable file, copy it over to the second machine, and run it there. But what, more, what else could we do? Well, to get something to run on that second machine, we could actually take the source code and assuming we have a compiler and linker, we can just compile it to object code and link it into an executable. Since we're using only the core libraries, we could also compile the source code on one machine to get the object files. We could share all those object files onto the second machine and then link on the second machine to an executable and run. So in this sense, we have portability of source code and we have portability of object code when we're running on the same platform um, with the same, uh, using just the C++ core libraries. Um, of course, there might be more involved. We might have source code that has dependencies on static libraries. Static libraries are ones that are contained in this, ob that are in object code, and the object code is all linked together into a single executable, so the executable is standalone. So going down the one side, you know, we could, uh, on, on machine one on the left, we can compile into object code. Uh, machine one has the object code available for these third-party libraries, uh, link it all together and get an executable. Um, we could take that executable and move it over to the second machine and run it. That would be fine um, because the executable is self-contained. Um, on the other hand, if we tried to go the second path, if we got all the object code, um, from compilation, or if we shared the object code from one machine to the other, if there were other libraries that were involved, uh, OBJ files, we would have to link them, we wouldn't be able to link them together because we wouldn't have all the parts. So let's take a moment and uh, see if we can exemplify that using real, um, using an example on Windows with a uh, Visual Studio compiler. The first thing we want to do is to demonstrate the build process as um, being composed of two phases. Uh, there's the compile phase and then the link phase. So if you're using Visual Studio uh, in the IDE, when you write your code, you go through some dialogues, you click build, and your program uh, seems to build, and then you can run it. So we're going to do it via the command line so we can see a, a little bit more of what's going on. So the first thing we're going to do, we have our single hello world program here, fairly simple. We're going to compile, uh, then we're going to link, and then we can run. 
So the first stage is to do the compilation. Don't worry too much about the syntax here. We're more interested in the outcome. Okay, so we do, we compile. We see we got a .obj file. And now we link, and what we do is we link the object code into an uh, executable. There's a little bit more going beyond behind the scenes here, but for our purposes, this is going to work. Um, we have our hello.exe that gets formed, and now we can run. Okay. That's all well and good. Um, normally, we don't have our systems can be composed of a single file. Uh, as things are complex, we need to break it up into parts to be more manageable. So what we'll do is create a uh, little library called hello library, and um, we'll farm out the details of trying to write something to the screen to that library. So we create this hello library. The dot, there's two files, a .h and a .cpp. The .h has the what's available. The .cpp is the how it's implemented. So we see that this library has an, a function called say hello. And uh, this is how it's implemented. It just has a simple cout statement saying hello static world. So we're going to replace our actual manually writing something out to call the function say hello, but in order to get access to it, we have to include the header file so we can see it. Okay, so we dot h. Okay, so the first thing, we can try to do what we did before. We can now, and so we can see what's going on, I will delete these. Okay, so what we'll do is first compile hello, um, like we did before. Okay, we get the object code file, no problem there. Um, basically, it compiles this file and says, okay, say hello, finds it defined here, it's good to go. Um, and then we try to link it. And what we run into is a problem. It's saying say hello, unresolved symbol. Basically, what it means is it's looking for the implementation of. Uh, or the object code associated to the say hello function, but it can't find it. Not too surprising because we never compiled hello library, which has the details. So we'll do that compilation now. And we get hello library.obj. And now we have all the object code we need, so we can link those together. So link hello.obj with hello library.obj. Okay, now we get our hello.exe and we can run. And we see hello static world, which is what was implemented in hello library. Um, of course, we, wanna, we also want to talk, or see, uh, you know, that we can move from one machine to another. Of course, if we had all the source code on our other machine, we'd be able to do the compilation um, and build our compilation on Lake, no problem, because we had everything available. But it turns out we can also, uh, if you notice, our link was done just by having the object code. Um, so the two stages say compile gets to the object code, and then once we have the object code, we link it together. So we could take our CPP file, our hello.cpp, our header file, so we can see the library, and the obj file for the library, the implementation, or the object code for it. Um, we can move that to our machine too. Okay, we're just using a file here. And then we can go in and do the compilation. All right, we'll do the compilation of hello to get the object code. So that'd be like us writing our little application on another machine, and we want to use the library. And now we have the object code available, so we just need, and we can just do the link of the two of them together. Okay, and then we can run. And we see that we are now running on machine two. All right, so we saw an example where we took the, uh, the application code, that was our hello.cpp, and uh, the third party uh, object library, which was the hello library, to the second machine. We didn't have the source code for the uh, hello library.cpp. We didn't have that to be able to compile it, but we were able to link our little application with the object code from the library to get an executable. So this is all done at the link stage, but it's also possible to have a situation where 
you have <coughs> um, built the executable, and executable depends on a third-party shared library. On the Windows machines, this would be a DLL, and perhaps at some point you've tried to run an application and you've got an error saying a, a certain DLL is not available. This is, uh, this is the situation here, so we're able to build our our application and there are hooks in the application that um, identify the need for this third-party library. So when the executable runs, uh, the environment knows to make that connection <clears throat> and does so, which enables the application to run. If you copy that executable over to another machine and that machine doesn't have this third-party library, doesn't have this DLL, then it's not going to be able to run. So let's take a moment and see if we can ex exemplify that. So we saw how static libraries worked in the sense that we had multiple CPP files, we compiled them into a collection of object files, and then we linked the object files together to create an executable. Uh, so now I want to just take a quick look at a uh, dynamic library um, in the Windows environment that's a DLL. So we're going to create a simple DLL and uh, see how that works. Um, but basically the structure is still the same. On our hello.cpp we have a main and we're just invoking say hello. Um, in this case, we're, we changed the library, so rather than using the static version, we're using uh, what we're, a dynamic version. The implementation of the dynamic version looks the same. It's just a simple see-out statement. Um, the header file is pretty much the same, with the exception of the special syntax that is just enabling the DL, or the DLL. Um, so, but in terms of compilation, we pretty much are doing the same thing. The only difference is we have, since there's going to be a dependency of the... Uh, CPP, hello CPP on the dynamic library, there's a little bit, some work to be done. We're just going to simplify the steps and um, we'll start by just compiling the um, dynamic library into a DLL and then we will just build, uh, rather than making multi-stage, we'll just build the uh, uh, main here into an executable. <coughs> Again, don't worry too much about the syntax, but we're going to first take our dynamic hello library and create a DLL about, out of that. Alright, if you notice over here when we did that uh, compilation we got a lot of artifacts. Really the ones we're interested in are the .lib file and the .dll file. In fact, we can get rid of the other ones. Um, but for now we're just going to... the .lib file is, we'll see, is that is what's being pulled in when we um, compile it or when we build the hello cpp. It's sort of taking the place of the .obj file from the previous example. So anyway, well, we have that together. Now what we're going to do is uh, do our build of hello.cpp and we have to indicate um, that we're linking it to this lib file here so dynamic lib alright so now we see our hello.obj and our hello.exe and we can run it okay and now, um, if we wanted to, you know, we can, if we were to pass this hello.exe uh, file off to another machine, which is kind of what we'll do now, is we'll take hello.exe, um, let's say we want to hand that off, so the equivalent would be copying, and then we'll go into machine 2, so let me delete these from a previous thing, okay, we'll paste in here, hello.exe, um, we'll transition over to that machine, so cd to machine 2 and we'll try to run hello and we get an error saying um, uh, the DLL is missing. I'm sure most of you encountered this at some point. Um, so what we need to do is to go back and copy the DLL file. In other words, make sure that DLL file is available on this other machine is what we're simulating here. So now with the DLL available, we type hello, uh, try to run it. It runs just fine. All right, so hopefully you have a sense of what it means to run an application without a DLL, and then once we put it in there, we didn't do any recompilation or relinking, and we're able to run the executable sort of on this uh, this second machine. Now let's move on to Java and see how it differs. So you know, as with C++, as we might expect, we have to write some source code. Uh, that code is contained in .java files. And then we want to compile. Uh, if we're on a Windows machine, we need a compiler that can run on a Windows machine. If we're on a Mac, we need to have a compiler that can run on a Mac. And when we do this, we end up getting 
um, generating these .class files. Um, and inside those .class files is what we refer to as Java bytecode, um, sort of the, the very similar to uh, the object code. What's interesting, though, is that the Windows compiler and the um, OSX compiler, they both generate the same .class files. So regardless of the, the platform you're on, when you compile your Java code, you're going to get the same uh, .class, Java bytecode. Once you have the Java bytecode, what you need is virtual machines. And if you have a virtual machine that can run on a Windows or one that runs on Mac or Linux or whatever you would like, uh, once you have those virtual machines, you can point the virtual machine to run these class files. The class files get loaded into the virtual machine and executed. So what we have is the class files, be, I mean, certainly the Java files are portable, but the class files themselves are portable and move from machine to machine. That's kind of the purpose of Java. So we talk about Java being highly portable. It means that we can write the code once on some machine, we compile it, and those, those class files become usable on any machine. Uh, much like what we saw with the static libraries, if we are uh, with, in Java and we want to be able to um, have an application run, uh, we have to have all the dot class files. So if we only copied some of our class files from the Windows machine to the Mac machine, uh, we wouldn't be able to run the Mac machine. Uh, you have to have all these dot all the dot class files related to your application in order for your application to run. That shouldn't be too surprising. Uh, what other issues can you uh, run into? Is um, we're assuming in this picture that all the Java files we have are things we wrote and are use only the core Java libraries. Uh, so a couple things can go wrong here is uh, if you have incompatible compiler and virtual machines. So if your virtual machine is older than your compiler, so if your virtual machine, say, was uh, version 1.6 and your compiler was version 1.7, um, any code compiled in the 1.7 with a 1.7 compiler is not compatible with a 1.6 virtual machine. kind of makes sense because if the language or features or uh, well, have evolved from one to the next, uh, there's uh, things in the 1.7 the compiler makes uh, assumptions in the 1.7 environment that the 1.6 virtual machine can't, um, can't understand. And the other thing is dependencies on third-party libraries. Um, this basically comes down to having the right class files uh, when you uh, go to run or compile. Anyway, so that's a subtle, you know, the uh, quick uh, down and dirty difference between C++ and Java in terms of how you get from source code to applications and a little bit on what it means when we say Java is a very portable language.